So <clears throat> thank you. Um, before we get started, we just want to acknowledge our pre presence on the traditional and ancestral and unceded territory, territory of the Gabrielino and Tongva peoples. And we'll throw a link in the chat to learn more about the history of this territory, um, as well as another link to learn more about the history of all those lands that are inhabited by non-Indigenous people across the country um, for you to explore. So I want to just briefly introduce the SEALs team. We have a diverse group of folks um, who are, I think everyone's here, almost everyone's here, um, with a variety of different expertise. Um, and this amazing team is here to help support you um, in all the questions that you have or concerns that you have about pedagogy and instructional design, as well as data analysis um, and we have a new member, Megan Libra, who's our communications manager, who we're very happy to have organizing all of our communications and promotions. So um, very excited for this amazing team. And lastly, before we get started, I just wanted to share with you lots of opportunities that you have to engage with professional development to support your teaching with SEALs, everything from some brand new summer institutes we're going to be rolling out this summer pedagogical workshops on equitable teaching, specific workshops on anti-racist teaching. We have a terrific SEALS Journal Club that Sapria organizes that um, delves into deep, deep learning on education research and discussions. Um, we will have our Brew and Learn workshops that we will continue to hold throughout the year for those who want to learn how to just use it basically, but also if you want to do a deeper dive um, we of course have our website resources, our teaching guides, our newsletter, and then we have a deep dive in teaching call in a program called the Faculty Learning Program, which is a year long program if you want to um, really think about the pedagogy and um, some of the education research and then how to apply that to your teaching. So if you have any questions about any of these things, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. So we're going to do our little introduction here, and then we're going to talk about the most highly voted questions that were voted um, in our RSVP form. Um, we'll have time for you as an audience to answer, ask questions, um, and then we'll wrap up and talk a little bit about self-care. So I just want to, of course, acknowledge that we are living in a world of deep uncertainty um, not knowing what's coming, not knowing which transition is coming next, and um, having to cope with all of that uncertainty is ext extremely stressful. Um, and I know that we're not only dealing with our own residual or current trauma from this pandemic, but also of our students, and that um, is a heavy load to carry. And so I just wanted to take one minute um, to model a technique that you can use to help with some self-calm. Um, and this is just about breathing. And I think uh, we breathing breathing's underrated. <laughs> we don't think about it much, but um, when we do it and pay attention to it, it actually can really help calm our nervous system. So I thought we would just take a minute before we get started and model this and give you a chance to practice. Um, so for one minute, let's just practice breathing. And so what I'd like you to do is wherever you are, just put both feet on the feet on the floor. Um, silent your phone if you can, turn it over, turn off your email, um, place both feet on the floor, your hands on the lap on your lap. And then just sit in a relaxed position. If you're comfortable, you can gently close your eyes or you can fix your eyes in the space in front of you. And we're just going to take this one minute to connect with your breath. And it's just a moment to stop planning and simply be in this moment. You can take a deep breath in, count to four, and then slowly release the breath out. As you do, release all the tension in your body. And take another deep breath in. On the count to four, hold it, and then just let out all the stale air in your lungs. And then just let yourself breathe 
without trying to change the way you're breathing. Just naturally breathe in and out. Relax your jaw. Relax your shoulders. And just notice how one breath is different from the next. Whatever's going on in your mind, just let it come and go. Relax your face, relax your shoulders. Notice your breath. And then just feel any tension you have melt away. If your eyes are closed, you can gently open them and we can begin. All right, so big shout out and welcome to all of our guests today. Thank you for coming. Um, we have uh, four terrific instructors, faculty here. Um, Al Corey from Chemistry and Biochemistry, Eric Deeds from Integrative Biology and Physiology, Deb Peters from the Life Science Corps, and Morgan Ting Tingley from Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. So nice spread of life and physical sciences here. We have some great technical support um, to answer your technical and IT questions. Enrique Reyes from Statistics, Jonathan Rogers from the Life Sciences, and Cody Ash McNally from Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences. I apologize if I'm pronouncing anyone's name wrong. Please let me know if I am. Um, from online teaching and learning and the LMS transition team to take notes and also and hear what some of your issues are, but also help um, answer your questions. We have Brett Brickman and Augustine Rios from the transition team, Kim DeBacco, Mark Kayser, and Siri, I think is how you pronounce your name. Please let me know if that's wrong. Yes. Um, Wang from OTL, is that right, Siri? You did, perfect job. Oh, fantastic, okay. And then we have three amazing students with us today. Graduate student, um, Imani Cook from Ecology and Evolutionary Biology, and two terrific undergrads, Kaylee Baer, and Naomi Hammonds um, from Engineering, Physical Sciences, and Psychobiology. So thank you all for coming. We really appreciate you spending the time with us this morning. And with that, we are gonna start with our questions. Um, we have a doc um, that we've created that I have, that our terrific team has created um, with the questions that were asked ahead of time and some of the answers that folks have responded to. So you all can have access to that doc as we are going through these questions. Um, and so let's just get started. Um, we're gonna start with the most highly voted questions. So these are the things that people were most interested in hearing about. And the first one is about what are faculty, grad students, and undergraduate students struggling with? And what are some ideas to address these struggles? And so I'm gonna start, go right to our faculty team. We'll start there and um, I'll let anyone from our team jump in and, and answer. Or I can call on you. Does anybody have a... Al is smiling. Morgan is smiling. Morgan, I'm gonna start with you because I see you first. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I think right now everyone is struggling with a lot of uncertainty um, about, I know personally myself, um, I'm struggling with how, you know, for me, it was, it was familiar at the start of the quarter to go back to remote teaching because that's what I've been doing for two years. Um, and so that wasn't a hard transition per se. It was a little hard in that, you know, it was, you had in your mindset that we were going to be in person, but then we switched to being remote. Um, and now it's kind of at this, we're like right at this cusp where it's like, are we going to go back to in-person? Are we going to stay remote? And then there's messages coming daily about, well, if we do this, then you can petition to do that. And so it's just a lot to keep track of. And as an instructor, it's hard to know what's best. You know, I think my students are really divided between what they think is best for themselves. I know I have a portion of my students and my TAs who really want to be in person. And there's a certain percentage, and I don't know if it's a minority or not, that really wants to be remote. And, and 
it, you know, so the solution maybe is to do everything, but as an instructor, that's just like double my work. And so it's like, how can I try and make everyone happy and teach in modes that, that is effective while also being fair to myself in that I can't do everything and that I, you know, I can only teach one class, not two. Yeah. Very challenging, right? Um, thanks, Morgan. Anybody else? Yeah, Deb, go ahead. It's like, I couldn't get to the raise my hand button fast I enough. Saw so, you. I my hand. <laughs> <laughs> so I really um, want to echo what Morgan had mentioned about there's a lot of uncertainty and students aren't sure about some things. Um, and I think that, you know, for, for our students, because I teach mostly first fall admits in during their first year. Uh, and so we always try in that first quarter to kind of set up something that they can depend on and rely on. And so we, we had made the switch to Canvas. Um, and now in winter quarter, more courses have made the switch to Canvas. And um, I, I, I had an interesting thing happen where it, if you went to a, one of the wonderful SEALs workshops on how to set up your Canvas site, it said, just copy this template and then we can show you how to populate, right? And I didn't do that. So I had decided that I would try something different so that the course homepage looks a little bit different. And, and, and that, um, while students appreciated pictures and different kinds of links, there was a little bit of, um, I still don't, where do I find the week three module? <laughs> right? Because yeah. it's not, wasn't just quite like the template. So I have um, discovered that, that maybe there have been some safety and really, really wonderful, I would say and um, have really like figured things out and they help each other out. And so it's, it's been wonderful in that respect, but I do, I do worry just a little bit about, are we really gonna go back on site and how are we gonna help the students transition? And when that comes, what am I going to do? Because I have three students that have already told me that they can't fly back from their home country um, and so it, it's another layer of things that have to be kind of taken care of. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I think that that those the struggles really are kind of this background kind of general anxiety about are we really going to be online finally? Um, and if not, what is that going to look like? And I am having probably the largest struggle is trying to figure out what are all the possibilities to be able to help students deal with that and help myself deal with it really. Yeah. So Kaylee, I noticed you also, you have your hand up and Emily as well. And you had some great comments about this in the chat. So go ahead and in the Google doc. So go ahead and share what you were gonna say. Go ahead, Kaylee. Oh yeah, hi everybody. Um, I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about what Dr. Pyers brought up, which was the usage of Bruin Learn. Um, at least it's from a student perspective, it can be very confusing to navigate Bruin Learn when every professor it feels like is utilizing Bruin Learn in their own way. And it's really easy. Like I completely didn't know we had like a homework assignment last week just because every professor I have uses Bruin Learn so differently that it's really easy to miss assignments. And my roommates and I were like, they don't know when their midterms are just because they don't know where to find it on Bruin Learn. Um, so I think it's a really common struggle um, that students are just struggling to locate the um, like materials and necessary for the course, which just contributes to the anxiety of what's going to happen in two weeks. Will we be in person? I don't know. But also added on top of that, it's like I don't really know what's going on in any of my courses, which kind of adds to that feeling. Um, so I'm not sure what can be done about that necessarily, but having like a more uniform way because CCLE was very easy to navigate and everything was grouped under by week, but Canvas, it's a lot more difficult to do that. So um, I think just putting things under one tab would be really helpful. Yeah. Great. Thank you for that, Kaylee. Um, Imani? 
Yeah, Katie um, explained it perfectly. I completely agree with her. There is, it is kind of hard of navigating Canvas. I believe there's so many um, different ways that you can utilize Canvas um, that it's not seen across the board. So Canvas is definitely one of those struggle situations. And I understand that we're still transitioning. transitioning. Um, we're still trying to get to understand it. Um, the faculty are still trying to get to understand how to actually navigate Canvas. So I completely understand, but um, it does kind of change the dynamics of how the students are able to find, to find certain activities and things like that. However, um, I have seen in some classes where they pretty much give like a blueprint to everything, like on the home address, on the home page, they pretty much just put all of the important things so that way it can direct them, which I think is pretty cool. So I really feel like it's just a trial and error type of situation um, during this time. But yeah, Canvas is definitely one of those struggle situations. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'm hearing that just having the instructions and knowing how to, you know, having some detailed instructions about how to navigate could be very useful, especially when the sites are very different. Morgan. <clears throat> Hearing that generosity from the students is, is really lovely. Thank you. <laughs> um, the, you know, I, I definitely can uh, agree with both of those experiences. You know, I had, it was, it's trial and error, right? So like, I think my first week, the first assignment, we put it where we, we had a quiz, we put it in the quiz section, but it hadn't been added to the modules, it hadn't been added to the front page. And so some percent, certain, certain percentage of the students didn't know where to find it. And so the, the attitude I've taken is with Canvas is redundancy is really good. So you can you can create the thing in the quiz section or you can create it in the in the modules, but then you can add the links around all sorts of places. And I spent a, a week with a good friend right before the start of the quarter who's from another university who's been using Canvas for years. And he showed me some of his Canvas sites. And I was like, oh, this is great inspiration. And you know, his attitude was to kind of have that homepage and have everything on that homepage as much as possible. And you might create the quiz or the assignment or whatever on sort of a different tab, but then you add that to that homepage and it kind of keeps everything running and you, you then direct students that are there to, to go there. Um, and that's that's a strategy I've taken, and it it seems to have smoothed out now that we're in week three. Great, thanks, Morgan. Naomi, hey everybody. Um, so back on the Canvas and Burn Learn um, type note, um, I think another thing students are struggling with is that um, even some of my classes are still using CCLE. Um, so navigating a bunch of platforms is kind of taking a toll on us. Um, having to go from Brunner and checking, getting used to that new platform and checking all your assignments there and still having to go back to CCLE and being like, oh, I still have my assignments here, which I know how to find, but you're still getting lost in some of the miscommunication. Um, so I think that's where um, Campus Wire and message boards like that really come in handy so that students can ask those questions. Um, and sending um, some of my professors send out like weekly recaps of like what's due, like what's coming up, and they put links so you can find it pretty easy. Um, so yeah, that was just something I wanted to mention. Thank you so much. I should also let everybody know that we, I think Supriya is keeping notes and we are collecting um, all these terrific ideas and strategies that we will share with everyone so that um, you'll have a resource at the end of this. Um, okay, thanks, Eric. Yeah, I was just going to add the perspective that um, for everyone, you know, it was going to be a difficult transition to go to Brew and Learn regardless, right? I mean, changing a platform for everyone, for the faculty, students, TAs, um, that was going to be challenging. And I think what's really just made this so incredibly difficult is the fact that when you're in an online setting, the LMS that you use suddenly becomes you know, 10 times more important even than it would normally be um, because um, you're in an online setting and that's how people access content, organize the course. Um, and I think that's just compounded the transition in a way that, um, you know, it's really intense. There are a lot of resources um, for faculty that have been produced by the university, by SEALs and others, but, you know, faculty are, 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 are at the edge of what they're going to be able to do having to again move to an online format, even though we're now used to teaching it, 
you know, we're not necessarily prepared. And remember that, you know, the, 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 the decision to go online was not made in the middle of the fall quarter when people were, if they're ahead of the game, starting to prepare materials. Even if you taught a class several times, you work to do, right? So I think, I think it's just made this, it's sort of like a perfect storm. Um, uh, and, and now, you know, faculty and, and TAs are having to think about how are we gonna structure the class if we do have half of the course online and half of the course in person. So, um, you know, those resources I think are hard to fully utilize um, because that takes bandwidth. Yeah. Finding them and then implementing the suggestions. And so um, anyway, I don't have a solution for that necessarily, um, but I, I know that from a faculty perspective, um, you know, uh, 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 having to learn a new system was already going to be crazy. And, um, uh, uh, and from a student perspective, it was going to be crazy. And perhaps we just need to be as, you know, forgiving of ourselves collectively as we can. If students miss things because of this, we just got to gotta try to help. If, if faculty are, you know, struggling to figure out how best to architect their Canvas site, then, you know, then, then we try to give them resources, but, you know, there's only so many hours in a day. So I don't know if that's a helpful perspective, but that's, that's how I feel. And the other thing I wanted to say is that I love the emails from the university that say, oh, you know, we're so proud of you for all doing that. I'm like, look, you don't give us, I mean, we have no choice, you know, like, you know, it's like, thank you for all of the craziness you're doing. Like, well, you know, right. I mean, okay. Right. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. Yeah, I, I think that that point about, uh, you know, taking a breath and giving yourself grace and your students grace and students also giving faculty grace, which I, I think we're hearing, is it's very much appreciated. That goes a long way. So, Mark. Well, thank you. Um, first, just want to acknowledge the student voices. It's, it's difficult and courageous to speak to power. So I just want to appreciate that they are lending their voice to this. Um, uh, that's the first thing. The other thing, uh, I don't know if it's clear, my role is with two groups. One is OTL, which is the online teaching learning group. And the other one is the LMS transformation. So I, I'm, I'm sort of speaking right now from the LMS side here. Uh, and I really want to make it clear that our group is here to help you with these things. Eric brought up, how are we gonna manage only, only so many hours in the day? We have a team of grad students. We have a team of instructional designers. And so we're here to help you. Please use us. That's, we don't wanna just be, we're not twiddling our thumbs and we don't wanna keep twiddling. <laughs> we're here. <laughs> so uh, the other thing I wanna mention, and I think um, this was brought up by the faculty saying there is a template. And um, I, I know that communication is hard with how much communication is coming out, but I just wanna give a little context to the template. It's not just my opinion. I feel like this is the best choice sort of situation. There's been some research done into usability and navigation in Canvas. And so the thinking, the legwork has been done. So it echoes the student voices. We did usability testing with students, watched how they behaved in Canvas. And as they point out, I can't find things. So that's why we built the things the way we did. It wasn't just, I think that looks cool that way. <laughs> Um, so we know how people navigate in Canvas. So if you have questions like, where's the best place to put an assignment? Where's the best place to put a reading or video and so on? That thinking, that research has been done. So we're here to consult with you about that. And we're happy to discuss with you. Um, I'll just make a, a small comment because I both taught and designed. Um, you as an instructor put things where it makes sense for you to put it. Great, amazing. Um, we're welcoming students into our house. We want to put things where it's like comfortable for our guests to find things, not just because I want to put the blender in the middle of the floor. Um, that, sorry, that's about my house. Uh, <laughs> you know, we want to make things that are useful for our guests. Um, so that's just a couple little context things. But again, just please feel free to use us. We're here. We have a couple of people on the call, uh, Saray and Augustine. Um, they'll be able to talk about it as well. They're happy to work with faculty. It's what we're it's what we're paid to do and what we like to do. So just wanted to put a little bookend on that. And again, thank you for the student voices. I really appreciate them. Thanks, Mark. That's really good to hear. Um, good to know that resource is there. Al. Oh, I just, well, first of all, I wanted to echo what people have already said, which is that the faculty need to go easy on themselves and, and to realize that things aren't necessarily going to go perfectly. And, you know, I think we've already seen evidence that the students understand that. Um, Second of all, I just wanted to say that, you know, from my experience with Bruin Learn, I've learned quite a bit. And one thing that 
Bruin Learn has is this really nice course calendar. You can make sure you put all your assignments on the course calendar. You know, if there are things that, if they're like quizzes that students have to complete or assignments they have to turn in, they get crossed off you know, on the course calendar when they have completed them. And another thing, you know, the difference between CCLE and Bruin Learn is that in CCLE, there was basically just one page, right? There was basically just one page. And so everything was on one page. Um, in, in Bruin Learn, there's this sort of this, this paradigm of, of, the, of the pages. And actually, I didn't understand that at first, but once you, under, once you understand the sort of the importance of the pages, I think it makes everything much clearer and much easier. I mean, even the home page is really, up, you know, just one of your pages. So anyway, that's just. Thank you, Al. So I'm going to move us to the next question, um, and I think this is a super important one. Um, what are some ways that faculty can help support struggling students and better build communities of students to support one another, especially in the remote environment? And I also just want to remind everybody that you're welcome to use the chat um, if you have other questions as well. So who would like to, I'm actually going to call on Deb to start us off with this question. So um, I, 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 I think I'm fortunate enough that some students have reached out and said that they're having some difficulty um, with things. And so um, I will ask them if, if they wanna meet separately and have met with students separately, but then have advertised the time of that meeting after asking the student if it's okay with them, if other students come that are also having like issues with navigating or issues with studying. Um, I know that Al mentioned the calendar, which is wonderful, um, but um, some students, I guess, don't know that it exists. I think it was really underutilized in CCLE. And so students aren't familiar with a calendar function in an LMS um, and like sending that out in an announcement, you know, when the title of the announcement is not sure when your next assignment is due, right? And, and then the body of the announcement says, here's how you check your calendar. Um, and this will give you everything. And we've really, I put this in the chat too, but we've really utilized modules where you can stick uh, pages, files, assignments, everything can show up in a weekly module. And so we have links for weeks one through 10, similar to CCLE, um, trying to mimic that. And the template has that too, if you use the template. Um, and, and so organizing in that way um, has helped. But I, I do find that there's just some students that have a fear of clicking, which I, this is my own, I guess, implicit bias where I think all students are click happy and anytime they see a link, they must click on it and go to, and, and they don't. And so I think that um, one of the things that I would, you know, have done in these, you know, little let's get to know Canvas a bit better um, office hours that I've had or just individual meetings even that I've had. I will just ask students over and over. They're like, well, where do I find this? I'm like, well, where might you click? Right. So that I'm asking them, that, well, maybe here, well, let's click there and see what happened, you know? And so just to, then if they didn't click on the spot that would take them to where they wanted, I would say, oh, well, that doesn't take us where we want to go, but look what we learned by clicking on this. And, you know, and so that's, um, you know, I really find that that little announcement, maybe with the screenshot, maybe with a not sure where to go or haven't used the calendar function yet, anything like that um, is useful. I actually just, I did send a chat to Naomi because I was kind of curious about, I don't know how students feel about getting spammed a million times by me, <laughs> but I, I, you know, rely on announcements kind of heavily. And I find that even making announcements and sometimes at the beginning of class meetings, they're missed. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm still trying to find a way to make sure that students are getting the information that we're sending out. Mm -hmm. Um, but um, we have, we use Campus Wire in the seven series courses, and that has also been another avenue of communication where we can tell students where to find things um, and not just on Canvas, yeah. but navigating the UCLA app and everything. 
I just want to also just echo what's in the chat about giving students or recording a brief camp course tour and making it clear to your students how you want them to navigate the site. I know I did that with my students this quarter and they the response was really positive. That really helped them. Um, any of the other faculty want to respond to this question about building community for students or helping support those who are struggling? Paul? Uh, yeah, uh, what I do is I refer students to the student groups in our department, which are fantastic. Uh, we have groups in the computer science department that, you know, the ACM and the UPE and that sort of thing. And they're very good about not just helping students with, you know, technical problems with the classes, but just giving them that feel of camaraderie. I, I, I've been heavily relying on them in, in this past month. Great, thanks. And how about our students who are here? What are, what are your thoughts on how to help build community? What can faculty do? How can you help each other? Imani? Yeah, so I just wanna say that the professors that I've come in contact with have done a great job of doing this, I personally believe. Um, it's Zoom University is already weird. Um, so sometimes just talking at boxes or just looking at people, sometimes people cameras aren't on, you don't know who's behind the camera, you don't know if they're even right there. Um, so being as interactive as possible, possible is really nice, maybe starting off with Mentimeters or doing some interactive polling, um, trying to send them into the breakout rooms, maybe um, if you have clicker questions, doing the clicker questions, trying to engage with the chat, things like that um, to interact, to try to get some participation, some engagement, because we're not in person. Um, I think that's like one of the main priorities is trying to get the students engaged, maybe getting the students to work with groups and having some type of collaborative learning as well through um, remote learning is also a really good way to establish communities. And build communities. Thank you. Um, Kaylee or Naomi, do you have anything you want to add? Yeah, I can add on to that. Um, one thing that I really like that um, my LS7C class does is assigns us to learning pods. So learning pods are a group of like four or five students um, that share the same discussion section with you. Um, one thing I really like about this is that you get to meet people that not only share <laughs> the discussion section with you, but you also work with them outside of class outside of lecture, um, you have your own Zoom meeting, you have your own community agreement that you like abide to, um, you get to work on clicker questions with them, and we even have a group stage of our midterms um, with our learning pod. So you really get to know this group, and they even have like in the LS7 series that I've noticed is that even midway through the quarter, if your learning pod's not working with, like it's not working well, you can even switch another learning pod. So. It's, I feel it's a great experience, especially helping like other students and forming that community. Great, thank you. Kaylee. Um, so I guess coming from, so a lot of my engineering courses typically have independent or individual projects. And what I liked about this quarter is they changed those to be group projects and really changed a lot of our like reports or assignments. like. Any type of report we were doing became a group report, which was nice because otherwise in previous online quarters, like we would not have talked to each other. Um, so this was a really great way that we were able to like actually not be forced to work with other people, but like be given the opportunity to work with other people that we definitely would not have talked to previously and have like support when completing the assignments, um, which was really nice. That's great. Thank you, Kaylee. Yeah, in my class, we do affinity groups. And one of the biggest pieces of feedback I get is they are so happy to be with a group of people that they wouldn't normally have come in contact with. And that's um, that's been a really uh, exciting part of using Zoom that's, that's helped them. Um, OK, Siri. Um, so I, I just uh, want to share a little bit uh, experience, like uh, as an instructional designer, when I'm working with faculty and, uh, you know, talk about students in this process, I think in addition to all those great, like, uh, um, features in, in, in Brun Learn and all those, like, uh, faculty tried so hard to help students in this, you know, switch between platforms. So I think um, also faculty and students, they could uh, let each other know at the very beginning of their teaching to say, well, 
I'm new to the platform. You just uh, kind of admit it, like I'm new to this platform. And the students, you are new to the platform as well. Um, so they kind of, you know, share what they know about the platform. And then they can, I would say, like learn and grow together um, in this process. So that's not like a pressure on the faculty or the pressure on the students. So basically, they are in this um, process as a whole, you know, group. So this yeah. is just something I want to share. That's a great thing to share. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, yeah, Shab, I can tell you a little bit more about my affinity groups. I teach a course um, in career exploration. And so at right before the beginning of the quarter, I ask the students what career path they might be interested in. And then I group them according to that career path. Um, and they're in groups of three or four. Um, and I have 175 students. So I have an awesome TA who helps me with this. And on the first day of class on Zoom, I put them in breakout rooms with their groups. And then I give them a whole bunch of activities they have to go through together, including finding a time when they're, they choose to meet and how they're gonna meet. So they have to commit to it on a Google Doc and share it with us so that we know exactly what they've committed to. Um, and then they have each week a prompt or actually many prompts that they have to go through. And then they submit a accountability document. The group submits it. Um, and it's a, basically responding to those prompts and what they talked about. They can do it. They can record it. They don't have to write it. They can just record their Zoom session if they're on Zoom. Um, and hand that in, submit it. Um, and it's really, it's really been a great way for them to connect. And it's really, and they all, it's self-driven. So they have to figure out when they're gonna meet, how they're gonna meet. Um, it's just one hour a week and they love it. So it's been very, it's been very successful. All right, I think we're gonna move to the next question. Um, there, the next couple of questions have to do with assessments. Um, and I know there's been some concern about, can I keep my, uh, my exams online or my quizzes online if we do go back in, in person? Um, I wanna kind of save the hypothesizing about what to do if we go back in person, I think for another time, because we just don't know what's happening yet. We will um, next week, if we learn that we're gonna go back in person, we'll do this again. And we can talk more specifically um, about that, but we didn't want to spend too much time when we don't know what's happening. Um, but I did want to just give you all an opportunity to talk about assessments and how to do them remotely and best practices around that. Um, so anyone who would like to chime in about this, any of the instructors about how they've um, done instruct done remote assessments and what has been successful about that or not or struggles. Go ahead, Deb. Can, is it okay if I don't do exams, but do assignments instead? Because sure. this is a really nice uh, strength in Canvas and I'm not sure if this was the case in CCLE or not. Um, but with assignments, um, when you create a rubric and you click on the little button that says, use this rubric for grading and you can use the speed grader. Um, if you create your rubric in a nice way, uh, about three points for this, two points for that, and one points for that, and you word it carefully without giving away answers, when students go to look at the assignment submission, the rubric shows up for them and they know what the expectations are specifically. And if you do it by question, then they have a very nice guideline. And I've actually found that this has been um, good for students this quarter. Um, for reducing anxiety mm -hmm. um, about what really, what am, how much am I supposed to write? What is it supposed to look like, right? And we can say includes one figure that shows their data and an explanation, clear explanation of their data. And then two points is they include a figure or an explanation, but not both, right? So being able to forecast exactly what the expectations are, I think has been really, really helpful. And the students have really risen, risen to the occasion and the assignment submissions are phenomenal because it's no longer this black box of answer this question. Um, and, and as for exams, <laughs> I will say, um, I'll just say a little bit about that. Um, um, Canvas, and I think that they're working on this. We had a meeting with them before where we're trying to get pagination so that we could continue online exams. 
Um, but for right now, we've had to break things up into smaller quizzes because we can't have one really big one um, where students can navigate in between pages and where we have kind of descriptors with a series of questions that go with a single figure. So um, that's been a little bit of a struggle. And for our big exams, um, we still go to CCLE. So Mark, you're telling me that pagination is possible? Yeah, I'm not looking at your particular course, so I don't know exactly how you're gonna lay out your questions, but there's a fair amount of flexibility in how you arrange um, forward motion, back motion. There's a box that says students can't go backwards. So after they've answered, they can't go backwards. Um, you can choose one question per page. Um, so like if you wanted to set out, you'd have to lay it out um, craftily if you wanted to have parts, you know, but um, I have yet to run into one that can't be sort of thought through. Uh, maybe you have one that's incredibly complicated. That's possible. Um, but in general, <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's always a design question, right? So I'm not looking at your question, so I can't ideate on what might be the solution. But mm -hmm. there's a there's a, a lot of boxes we can check. And one thing that's not super obvious in Canvas, I'll just say this in general. Um, maybe this is annoying about Canvas. Maybe it's elegant. Who can say? But as you check certain boxes, the menus will change their dynamic. Um, so that, that makes it a little bit tricky because you're mm -hmm. looking at the page and you're like, I don't see a box that says don't let students go forwards. Well, it doesn't appear until you check this. You check this. Aha, now the option to limit motion is, is allowed. So it's possible that what you're looking for isn't there right now because you haven't triggered those dependencies. Um, it's a learning curve. I, I constantly, for mm -hmm. myself as a person who uh, works in Canvas, trains on it, will be like, I know this menu is here. <laughs> oh, I have to check this first. And now the menu appears. So it, it is not something that is always obvious. But um, just yeah. short answer, most likely positive. Uh, again, as keep keep saying this again, again, feel free to, to drop into office hour or come have a consultation with us. We're happy to work through these. We have the staff time to do it. So the sooner the better. Um, that's all I'll say about that. Okay, no, that's that's uh, wonderful. <laughs> uh, I've been clicking a lot of boxes and I haven't quite found it yet, but um, <laughs> I'll, I'll keep clicking or I'll come to an office hours. And Amber, yeah, you can shuffle questions. It's kind of nice. Um, I just want to echo uh, the question that Morgan put in the chat. It was also one of the highly voted questions that we had, um, which is about exams um and how to design them on on broom and learn um and so mark i don't know if you wanted to speak to that for a minute um or yeah just... we have some sorry to cut you off uh, yeah we have trainings uh prepared and so we're happy to shape them to your particular questions so uh just contact us and we can arrange a time uh, I'll, I'll handle one of the questions in the chat any plans to move to new quizzes so here here's what i'll briefly say about that is um, you can't not have it on on the whole Canvas instance. It's a choice of the default setting. And so I, I'll, I'll um, name my own sort of like um, bias here. I'm the one in Law's voice is saying, let's start with classic quizzes. And the, part of the reason is that new quizzes has been sort of semi-beta for so many years. And I just feel like if you get classes quizzes working for everybody, it's relatively trivial to move to new quizzes, but you can't go backwards. So if you build all your quizzes and new quizzes, and then you realize, hey, this this is terrible. My students hate it. I hate it. I can't. Well, now you're stuck. You can't go backwards. But once you have your classic quizzes, you can experiment with converting them to new quizzes. Hate it. You still have your classic quizzes built. So that maybe that's me being a little bit cautious. So um, if you're a person who really wants to experiment with new quizzes, you know that you want to take that on. Contact us. We'll make you a sandbox site. We'll turn it on in there. You can play. Um, I would just, again, caution you that don't put 100 hours in the question banks before you know that new quizzes is, is your way. I see a lot of nodding. Okay, thank you. Awesome, thanks, Mark. Um, and we can also talk after you, with you as well. If SEALs can be helpful um, with that. We'd, we'd be happy to, to organize something. Um, any other comments about exams online, assignments online? I just had one quick thing to add, just with my experience with creating quizzes. Two two things that we learned the hard way. One is that after you create a quiz, you have to remember to publish it. Um, and so we made that mistake once. Uh, the second thing is my experience in Canvas is that um, the student view is, is really useful and it's like always there, um, which it really kind of wasn't as easy to use in CCLA. And so 
um, when designing quizzes and things like that, always kind of going to the student view and making sure that things look okay and trying to and going through it is what I've what I've had to do and it's worked okay. Thanks, Morgan. Um, okay, I want to go to the next question, um, which has to do with uh, how to support students who need to miss class being sick. And so um, this is an important question, whether we are remote or in person, but um, I'm just curious to hear what your thoughts are about how to how to do this. one. Okay, Imani, go ahead. Um, I'm not, this is a tough question. I'm not too sure on how to answer this because there is the daily monitoring survey. Um, the only thing about the daily monitoring survey is that I don't, you know, you don't want to assume that your students are lying, um, but they could abuse use that um so it's really hard to uh, like really navigate when students are sick because of course you want students to put their health first um that should always be the top priority above i feel like that should be the top priority above anything you have to put your health first so that you can do fulfill the positions that you committed to um but one thing i can say is that having some type of alternative assignment maybe it's not the exact same type of assignment that um, the students may engage with when they're actually in the class, but having some type of alternative assignment will be very helpful for students that are not able to come when they're sick. Okay, thank you. Kim? Yeah, I was just going to offer a simple strategy. I think um, in these times of remote teaching, um, and, and this works well in online teaching as well, a good strategy to have is to use group work in your class so that when students are in groups, they've got buddies who can help them. Um, I have very deliberately used a study buddy kind of concept, that's dyads or pairs um, in a class. And that's not necessarily just suddenly to meet the needs of a sick student, it's an actual strategy that I employ in the class for other reasons as well. But having someone else in the class they can turn to is really good, it takes some of the pressure off you. I think the other suggestion maybe while I think of it is to have a really organized, a well-organized, you know, um, CCLE or Bruin Learn site so students know where to get resources and if you are doing live lectures um, if you're doing Zoom class then I guess you would re record your class and make that available for those who can't be there but if you're building community in your class if you've got groups you've got pairs I think that's going to support those students who can't make it and who are, who are not feeling well and so on so anyway great thank you Kim Eric Unmuting is always a thing. So um, the the uh, one of the strategies that that we employed uh, or that I've employed in, in some of my classes has been, you know, just making sure that you've thought out and intentionally sort of dealt with that ahead of time. So for instance, in, you know, a lot of the classes I teach, learning is very active. There's a lot of participation points. So students are going to miss class when they're sick. Um, and look, they're going to miss class when they're sick, even when there isn't COVID, you know, and uh, people get sick all the time. I get sick all the time with not COVID. So, you know, it's it's helpful to have like, you know, so we have alternative ways to participate in the class if you can't make it um, uh, in per, like during the live lecture, be that a live lecture on Zoom or a live lecture in person. Um, uh, I think that one thing I noticed last quarter, and this is going to be important when we go back to um, in person, you know, whenever that happens, is that because of the symptom survey, um, you know, and I think this was legitimate, I don't think anybody in my class was using this in any nefarious way, they're just not allowed to come to class when they have the sniffles. And, um, you know, that you have to be like, um, uh, 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 sort of thinking about what that means for how you assess students, um, you know, and how you, how you, you deal with that. So I just always, been uh, a fan of having something alternative big assessments you know like a like a test you know like a high stakes thing 
Um, uh, summative assessments like that, if we go back in person and we're doing those in person in large format, um, that I think that I think is really tricky. The last thing I'll say is that one thing I noticed last quarter, not so much this quarter, but last quarter, um, you know, people aren't necessarily, students aren't necessarily getting ahead of when they are, are ill. So um, I have had students who have had significant trouble due to COVID or other things and missed quite a lot of stuff. And I only find out later in a huge class, it, it can be hard to keep track of students, but I think in this context, it's absolutely vital because, you know, having TAs, you know, sort of be on top of that. Maybe a lot of people are doing that as a best practice anyway. Um, but, you know, I found that students aren't necessarily as um, sort of proactive about contacting instructors um, when they're struggling with illness uh, in this context. So um, I, I've, I've found that like, basically it means that I, I have to be more flexible when I do find out about those things and also try to be more on top of the students to make sure that you're, you're supporting them. Anyway, that's my feeling. <laughs> Great, thank you, Eric. Yeah, and I think even communicating that in your syllabus, right? Making it clear. Um, yeah, Brittany's like, yeah. Um, <laughs> making it clear what your policy is, how important it is for students to proactively communicate with you um, so that you know what's going on with them. Uh, that can have a really positive impact. Brittany, did you wanna to add to that? I'll just really quick say that, that, I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you, Brittany, but I just wanted to echo that Rachel and like, reminding students what the policy is, you know, in case they didn't read your syllabus or memorize it. Yes. Um, which is something that, I mean, you know, not everyone memorizes your syllabus. So reminding students what the policy is with some frequency, I think helps. Thanks, Eric. Go ahead, Brittany. Uh, so those two things I was actually coming to say, um, Rachel, that, you know, having it written out in the syllabus, maybe not precisely what you're going to do about it, but just saying, you know, you have systems in place to help if that, you know, ends up being the case. I think that a lot of students find that professors or faculty or TAs or these like, I don't want to say gods, but like, ah, I have to talk to them. This is very scary. Um, and we don't want to do that. Or we're trying to figure out another way that we can figure the figure it out on our own without having to go to that extreme route. Because what if they say no? Mm -hmm. um, also, you know, Mark said, uh, mentioning that with some frequency, I was thinking, you know, like, even if it's at the top of every week, just a couple of sentences in the first lecture every Monday, just reminding them, I'm here to support you, you know, if this happens, whatever, you know, contact me at, send me this, whatever you need to do. And then separately, um, I said in the chat, note taker, because um, when I was out, you know, I... It's really, okay, in live, in-person lectures, you just miss the lecture. There's nothing you can do to make up that time. Um, now with recorded lectures, yeah, sure, you can re-watch the lecture, lectures, but it puts you so behind because you already have a full plate of classes during the week. It's like, and, and studying and homework. When do you have time to really watch, sit there and watch this whole lecture? lecture? And sometimes, you know, um, professors, they maybe go off on a tangent or make jokes and it makes it light, great. But when you're trying to catch up, you're like, oh my God, okay, I have to get through this. So, you know, um, I feel like if there was some way that we could partner with like, or professors could partner with like CAE in the sense that they have note takers just to, you know, give them an outline, give Haley, we have about one more minute here. I'm going to let you have the last word. So if you can sum up what you want to say in, in a minute, that'd be great. Yeah, I just want to expand on what Brittany discussed a little bit. Um, so I think letting your students know upfront that you are willing to accommodate and that you will be accepting of different reasons, whether it's COVID or not. As someone who deals with like chronic health struggles, I'm always one to be afraid of what if they like delegitimize the, what I'm having because it's not COVID, things like that. Just being a little like 
very transparent. As Brittany said, I think a lot of us are very scared of reaching out just due to that power differential. Um, but just letting your students know that you're willing to accommodate for reasons, health reasons beyond COVID as well. Great. Thank you, Kaylee. So um, we're getting the end to the end of our time here. I want to just really express my gratitude and appreciation for all of our guest speakers, our faculty, the support that we have from IT and the LMS team, and of course, our students who gave such invaluable insights into their experiences that will really help us all um, be able to uh, respond best to everyone. And the last thing I just want to say is that we have all these resources that we will share with you in the Google Doc, in the chat. We'll share our slides. At the end of our slides, we have a bunch of slides on how to best take care of yourselves. And I think that that is such a key, important aspect of what we need to do to go forward successfully. Um, and so that's for all of us, our students, our, our faculty, everyone um, engaged in this process and, and trying to support each other. So I really appreciate you being here. Um, we'll do another one of these if we do in, indeed end up shifting to in-person next week. Um, and But we will be communicating with you and letting, us know, letting you know what we have available. So thank you all for coming. Um, we'll hang out for a bit if you have any questions. And thanks again.